Thank you so much, Johnny. Yeah, you know, when we planned this, we, we didn't realize it was Easter. <laughs> you, sometimes your calendar gets so cluttered on the computer, you turn off all the holiday things, so to just clear a little space. And, yeah, so somehow I'm, I'm here for Easter, can you imagine? And, and Carol's at home, and I'm here, and that's how it is sometimes. But... Anyway, God had a purpose in it. I met up with a guy on the flight out, and it was really cool. And uh, yeah, so the hand of the Lord is in it. So I'm here in the will of God. Isn't that great? Wow. Wow. Look at you all. You all look just so happy and amazing this morning. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about uh, why did Jesus have to die? I remember years ago, Time Magazine had a cover page at this time of year and a picture of Jesus on the front and with the, with the question, why did Jesus have to die? So if somebody asked you that, what would you say? Anyone? What would you say? Redeemed man. Because God asked him to. God asked him to? Anyone else? Louder? God started to do the holy work on that one. Uh-huh. But, you know, I always would follow that up with and say, yeah, but why, why was that necessary? Like, what's going on here? What was that? No other way, okay? We're getting closer to it. Um, it has to do with the fact that God is perfect. And it's hard for us to imagine a perfect person, a perfect being. I mean, look around you. Do you see any? I mean, you know. <laughs> so Johnny gives me a big build up. It's so good to have John here and this and that. And he's a general and so on. You know, I learned from Jack Winter years ago. I just want to be a little boy with a big daddy. And if I can do that, I mean, that's the deal. We're, we're not perfect, any of us. In, in fact, far from it. And that in itself is the issue right there. Because God being perfect has implications for you and me. And so what do you think the implications are? He's perfect and you're not. Okay, let me help you a bit. Someone who's perfect cannot allow injustices to get by. So when I hurt you, he's upset because that's an injustice. If I steal from you, if I take from you, if I injure you, if I sin against you in some way, that's an injustice that in his books must be put right. Do you understand that? And so in a perfect world, there would be no injustices. But look around you. What do you see? In fact, you know what? When you listen into a person's conversation, do you ever do that? If you're in a restaurant, you're having a meal, and you listen in at the table next to you, and they're they're talking about the injustices that happened to them and their friends. Why do you know what he said to me? Do you know what she did to me? Do you know this? Do you know that? I mean, I was so hurt. I was so offended. And and so it goes. And uh, we're just full of injustices. It's funny that way because we're both thick-skinned and thin-skinned. We're very thick-skinned when we're the perpetrators. Ah, oh, get over it. No big deal, you know. But when we're the victim, oh, that's a different story. The hurt went so deep, right? Are we like that? 
Are you like that there at the back, way at the back? Anybody? Yeah. And um, all these are the reason Jesus had to die. Because the human race had amounted such a, a, a massive debt of injustice that it was impossible for any of us to make it right. And so God introduced a concept that I like to call the innocent dies for the guilty so the guilty can go free. And we see it in animal sacrifice. Now maybe if you're a new Christian and you haven't had much time to think of a lot of this through, uh, you're kind of shocked reading the Bible for the first time at all the animal sacrifices going on. Did anybody relate to that? And you're kind of wondering, what is the deal with killing these little lambs? And, um, and what has this got to do with Easter this morning? Everything. Absolutely everything. See, it started off in Genesis with Adam and Eve. You remember that they, they sinned, they rebelled against him. Okay, there's an injustice racked up again. And he told them, don't eat of that fruit or you will surely die. Well, then the enemy came along and said, ah, you won't die. You'll just be wise like God. And they fell for it and so sinned. And then they realized in their nakedness that I think the glory had lifted off of them. And so they tried to make a nice suit of clothes or a dress out of fig leaves. I don't know how elaborate it was. I think it was more than three leaves, though, don't you? <laughs> it could have been quite elaborate, but the Lord said not good enough. And what did he do? He made them clothes out of skins. Where do you get the skins? An animal has to die. So shed its blood and provide a covering for the guilty people. And that started us off. And all through scripture we see animals dying so that the people had a basis for forgiving. And our question this morning is, why would God honor that? Like what is in the symbolism that so, uh, is so meaningful to him? And the symbolism is because that little lamb represents the one who is to come, named Jesus. Um, I think in the story of Abraham and Isaac, and, it, you know, the story used to really trouble me reading it because, let's see, where do we find that in, um, in, 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 well, it's in the book of Genesis 22, round about verse 9. You remember the story, Abraham has no children, yet he has a promise from God, your, your children are going to be like the stars of heaven and everything else, and it rolls around where, you know, they came up with an idea to have Ishmael through Sarah's maid. But God said, no, that's not what I had in mind. And so now at 99 years of age, he gets a promise that about this time of year, uh, your, your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Well, Abraham's 99 and, and Sarah's 89. And they thought that was the funniest thing they'd heard in a long time. But sure enough, Isaac was born, which means laughter, by the way. And so when Isaac is, I don't know, probably bar mitzvah age, somewhere around 12 or 13, that would put Abraham at around about 113. The Lord speaks to him and said, I want you to take your son Isaac, who you love, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice unto me, like you do with all these sheep over the years. 
And Abraham said, okay, if that's really what you want, I'll do it. Now, how many know that was really hard for him? That would be hard for anybody, especially when you really, really love your son, which he did. And the Lord says, take three days' journey, go to one of the mountains of Moriah that I will show you. And off they go, Abraham and a couple of his servants and Isaac. And they cut up a bunch of wood and took it with them for the sacrifice. Do you think he told Sarah what they were doing? No way. <laughs> She'd have said, I'm going to sacrifice you. That's what's going to happen. But no, they, they went off, and it turns out to one of the mountains of Moriah, to no doubt the highest peak there, which is Mount Calvary. And as they're going up the hill, Isaac has the wood on his back, being like a type of Jesus. And Abraham has the fire and the knife. And Isaac even said to him, Father, we have the... We got the wood, we got the fire, where's the lamb? And an interesting answer in Hebrew, God himself will provide the lamb, my son. And it could read, God will be himself the provided lamb. And up the hill they go, and, and you know, Isaac figured it out. I don't like the look in his eye, you know, maybe. <laughs> Like, why is he crying? <laughs> and, um, but they build the altar together. They put the wood on the altar. And then Isaac climbs up on the wood, willingly, seemingly. So who do you think could run the fastest? A 14-year-old or a 114-year-old? Probably the kid. But he doesn't do that. He submits totally to his father. Now, the big question always for me was this. God, why would you ask this precious old man, your friend, Abraham, to sacrifice his son? What kind of a God does that? And that always bothered me because it seemed like kind of the cruelest thing ever. Yeah, well, this is a test. I know, I get the test part. But a test like this? And I didn't have an answer for the longest time until the Lord spoke to me one day and he said, I wanted to know if there was a man anywhere, a father anywhere, willing to do with his son what I'm about to do with my son. And Abraham said, I'll do it. And apparently I had to cooperate. So at the last minute, stop. And the angel of the Lord stopped him. And wouldn't you know, there's a lamb caught in a thicket over there by its horns. And they went and got the lamb and substituted the lamb for Isaac. And so Isaac became like a double prophetic picture to us of both the sacrifice that Jesus was, and then the fact that someone else died instead of him. You see, God laid down a foundation for justice in all of this so that sin does not go unpunished ever. And um, we who are guilty have to have a basis for forgiveness in justice and in the law to satisfy the perfect justice of heaven so that God can be, out of the depth of his character, a loving father who wants to redeem and regain his children. And that's what all this is about. This is about Father God grieving over the waywardness of his, his family on earth that in many cases refused to have him rule over them. And so he came up, from the beginning of time, he came up with this master plan. 
Now, Easter is celebrating what the Bible calls Passover. And I don't know, we get it from a Roman goddess name called Astarte. But really, it's Passover we're celebrating this morning. And Passover began in the book of Exodus, where, again, the innocent dies for the guilty. And so the Lord says, all right, this is the final plague. The firstborn of every family and every animal is going to die when my presence, the death angel, goes through the land. And so here's what I want you to do. Take an innocent lamb, a year old, without blemish, and sacrifice it. Catch its blood in a basin and prepare it and get ready to eat that lamb. Take a hyssop weed like a paintbrush and paint it on the door of your house, the lintel and the two side posts. And they made the sign of the cross over their doorway. And he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over that house. And nobody died when there was blood on the door because blood indicated the price had been paid. And the Egyptians, they didn't do that. And so from Pharaoh on down, there was deep wailing and and it was the final thing, like, get out of here. They threw money at them and silver and gold and get out of our country. And Israel was freed from slavery on that day. What a prophetic picture. And so it takes us on down through 1,500 years of Israeli Jewish history where every year they would celebrate three main feasts, Passover, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, and the Feast of Passover was the spring feast, and that's, that's the one we're talking about. The innocent lamb dies for the guilty people, so the guilty go free, and blood has been shed as a symbol, a token to the Lord that one day the ultimate price is going to be paid. So let's go to Isaiah 53 now together. Isaiah 53 is an amazing uh, prophetic word. Isaiah lived about 700 B.C., so this is a 2,700-year-old prophecy. Let's go to chapter 52 for a minute at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled to be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. When you think of his face being so marred more than any man, you know, every year at Easter I like to watch the passion of, of the Christ. I watched it actually last Thursday, again. And it just horrifies me. It's kind of a, my soul needs it, but my, I'm revolted by the brutality of it. But here I'm reminded by Isaiah that he was marred more than any man. So that brutal whipping he took in that movie was not overdone at all. And... We go on in the next chapter. So shall he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths at him. Isaiah 53, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord, the power, the, the will of God been revealed? For he, the Messiah, Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. It's interesting about Jesus that he was a particularly good-looking, tall, dark maybe, but not handsome according to this. Why? Because when he 
resigned or left his position in heaven and took upon himself the form of a man, uh, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't even good looking. That that would help attract a crowd. But after the resurrection, did you notice that his friends didn't even recognize him? Well, what's up with that? Mary Magdalene doesn't recognize Jesus. She thinks he's the gardener. She says, wow, cool looking gardener, but <laughs> if you've taken him away, show me where you've, where you've laid him and I'll go get him. Type of thing. And he wasn't until he spoke, he said, Mary, ah, my teacher. And so when he left his glory, he was plain, I don't think ugly, but no beauty that we should desire him. And then it goes on, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, Hebrew sicknesses, and carried our sorrows, the Hebrew says pain, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, his whipping, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, Jehovah, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off, which means killed, murdered, from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isn't it amazing? That prophetic word, 700 years before Jesus came, says he makes his grave with the rich. You know, he's, a, he's buried in a rich man's tomb. To fulfill this word. It's odd that a rich man would offer his tomb. But he did, you know, because, hey, it was just for the weekend. <laughs> right? All that ancient prophecy coming together in the life of Jesus. And it's amazing to me how he fully orchestrated his death and, of course, I'm sure, resurrection. I have power to lay my life down and I have power to take it up again is what he said. But I want us to just dwell on the, on the why for a moment. He did this for you. Because see, if the justice of God is not satisfied, then that's as far as it goes right there. There's punishment ahead. Friends, we're talking about serious stuff for the human race right here. Because heaven is real. Have you guys spent any time looking in, into the things of heaven? I probably, be, when I was here before, recommended a book called Imagine Heaven. Did I do that? All right, Imagine Heaven by John Burke. He studied about a thousand cases of people who had had near-death experiences. And it didn't matter whether they were Christian or Muslim or Hindu or Jewish or atheist or whatever. They all kind of saw the same stuff. And it goes like this. 
Uh, I remember going into the hospital with extreme chest pain. I suspected a heart attack. And as they're working on me, suddenly I found myself lifting up out of my body. I saw everybody working on me. I remember the whole thing. And I'm wondering, what's going on? Have I died and everything else? I saw a man in white. I went through a tunnel. I had a life review of all the good, bad, and ugly. But then I was asked, do you want to go back? And reluctantly said yes, because it was so beautiful there. And I came back into my body just as they were resuscitating me and restarting my heart. And that's like so many of them. There are thousands and thousands. In fact, there may be people in this room who have had a near-death experience or out-of-body experience. If that's you, unashamedly wave at me right here. Just wave at me. Come on, hold your hand up high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. At least ten of you. This, is, this stuff is real. I just read a, a summary report of all the medical studies about all this stuff. And uh, it doesn't matter your background or what have you. When your brain is shut down, which is 30 seconds after your heart stops, it's incapable of thinking or imagining anything. And yet people revive and... They can tell you the exact procedures of their resuscitation and who was doing what. And there's surveys of where people born blind in, in, that, in that state can see for the first time. And they remember it all. It's a fascinating study. And there are thousands of them. Ten people right here in this room. Tell the person next to you, heaven is real. <laughs> but heaven is a perfect place, and so God's not going to allow you or me to mess it up. So we have to be made perfect as sort of the price of entry. And since you're never going to do that through self-effort, you need a savior. You need a, a perfect son of God who loves you enough to come and offer himself as a perfect, acceptable sacrifice for you to, in so doing, pay your debt so that you can be forgiven and go free and come on home. You know... Trevor and I were talking here, and he said, hey, he's going to be 50 next birthday. I said, good for you. That's an, <laughs> that's an achievement. And I said, I think you need to be about 50 years old before you realize a couple of things, one being that life is short. Because, you know, you turn 50, and you're like, how did I get here? And then it's 60, and then it's 70, and then it's 80, and you're like, oh, my goodness, you know. Life is short. Yeah. I remember my dad saying that to me. Mm. Life is short, son. I think I was 17 at the time. I'm thinking, yeah, maybe for you. But <laughs> <laughs> I got my whole life ahead of me. And uh, But it seems to go by real quick. You know, you just you just get to where you're having fun and, Next thing you know, most of it's behind you. I mean, I turned 82 last Christmas. And Carol's 80th birthday is coming up May 9. We're having a big deal for her. Don't tell her. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, 80. I can't believe it. My, my sweetheart is 80. How did that happen? And we just got back from Mexico, and she was in rare form there, yelling over people and praying for them and everything. It was, just, it was awesome. But anyway, we need a Savior, friends. And see, the Son of God came, born of a virgin, 
had to be. You know, even, that's even a tack these days. He had to be virgin born, or how could he be the son of God? You say, yeah, but that's, that's impossible. Not for God. You know, when you look around at the universe, you, you, you zoom in on what the, these telescopes in space are finding and the vastness of it and the complications of life and DNA and on and on and on. Whoever made all this is extremely smart. And even many scientists now are talking about intelligent design. Do you know many of them can lose their job at the university by believing in intelligent design? It's a little too close to believing in God. What a time we live in where all of a sudden God's become the enemy. He's not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. God is your friend. And John 3.16 needs to be one of our foundational verses. For God so loved the world, so loved you. And if you're a visitor here this morning, let this in, friends, please. Because this is the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Remember Abraham and Isaac? He wanted to know if there was a man anywhere who was willing to do what he's about to do with his son. And the difference here is his son is willing. He struggled in the garden for a bit. Ah, oh, I don't want to go through this. Is there some other way? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he signed up for it. Took that brutal beating. Took that horrific crucifixion. Six hours on the cross. Where he bled to death. Essentially, through the whipping, through the crown of thorns, through the nails in his hands and feet. Crucifixion is one of the most cruel deaths imaginable, but it's also one where the victim essentially bleeds to death till he has no more life blood to carry on. And Jesus dismissed his spirit and died about three in the afternoon, about the same time that all the other Passover lambs were dying, because you see, he made sure that he died exactly on Passover, right on the feast day, or the day of preparation, I should say. And then he's dead for three days and three nights, just like he said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the big fish. So the Son of Man will be. And what does that do? That makes sure everybody realizes he was dead for sure. And they had a guard over his tomb, and they sealed the tomb. And then <laughs> the breath of God blew into that tomb and raised him from the dead. You know, it just someone sent me an update on the Shroud of Turin last night, and I watched it. It was like, I don't know, almost an hour long, I think. But it proves beyond a shadow of any doubt that that was the burial cloth of Jesus, scientifically. And, you know, people are all saying, follow the science. You want the truth? Follow the science. Okay, follow the science. Follow the studies on near-death experience. You find out heaven and hell are real. Follow the science on the Shroud of Turin. You find out, yes, that is the burial shroud of our Savior. And his blood, AAB positive, is on that shroud. And there's, there's something on it that is not on any other cloth, on any other paper, any other photograph at all. And that is three-dimensional imprinting that is, that is embedded into that cloth they found, enabling them to construct uh, an image and a full body, actually, of the likeness of Jesus. Yeah. 
but he really died. Why? Because the Son of God dying for the whole human race It was an overpayment, if ever there was one. But your sin and mine was paid in full that day. And that's what he proclaimed. It's his dying words on the cross. There's a couple of things I'll mention. Number one, he said, it is finished. Um, the word is something like tetostaloi. I should have looked it up in Greek, which means Paid in full. And so when you went to the bank and paid off your debt, they gave you a note that in Greek would say paid in full. And that's the word Jesus used, the Aramaic equivalent. It is finished. It's paid in full. But another thing that, that, that troubles me is when he said, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? Do you remember that? What happened there? The Bible tells us that he who knew no sin, the perfect son of God, is being crucified for you and I. And at that last moment, the sins of the world are placed on that broken, emaciated, marred body. And he became sin who knew no sin. He took it on himself. He took my sin and yours and offered to me his righteousness. And when that reality hit our Lord Jesus, he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? It had never happened before in all of eternity. Think of it. But God, the perfect one, is like, I can't be near him. He's now become the sins of the whole world. <sighs> Three days of separation. Then he died. But he told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So he died from the face of the earth, but went to the place of the dead. And scripture tells us he brought captivity captive so Abraham and all the Old Testament saints were now gathered into an even better place because the debt was paid and the justice of heaven was more than satisfied because the son of God himself paid the debt you ever bailed anybody out? Have you ever helped them pay their debt so they get debt free? People are usually very thankful and appreciative for that. That's what Jesus is offering for us today. This is the reason he died. Thankfully, he didn't stay dead. He rose again and he appeared to many, his 12, the two on the Emmaus Road. Of course, they didn't recognize him because who is this handsome guy that doesn't know what's been going on around here? Yeah. He did it for you, friends. So I, I want to ask you this morning, do you need a savior? Or are you going to try and make it on your own? Because if you're going to try and make it on your own, all I can say is you better be perfect. Because the perfect one will accept nothing less. You know, the day I got saved, I didn't understand any of that. I just got under conviction of the presence of the Holy Spirit because of Billy Graham's <laughs> Turner Burn message. And... Yeah, I probably told you this story here, but I was 15 years old. We're in Exhibition Park, Toronto, the automotive building. Billy Graham's there preaching, and my family wanted to go, and they took me. And, uh, you know, it was a big event, and I made it through the first night. 
uh, without caving. <laughs> and oddly enough, I saw that as a win. <laughs> it was not a win. But then they wanted to go the second night. I didn't want to go. My mother said, I want you to go and come with us. So I knew that look. If you know what's good for you, you'll do it. It seemed like, okay. <laughs> and fighting it with everything that was in me, holding onto the back of the chair, saying, I am not going up there. My grandfather leaned over and he said, John, if you're not sure, you better go. Ah, oh, something just broke my stubbornness. And I jumped up out of that seat and ran out. I think I was the last guy at the altar. Knocked over chairs and everything else. And Jesus came into my heart that night. And I, I couldn't explain it. All I knew it was supernatural. The next day, the sky was more blue. The grass was more green. Everybody I met was a wonderful human being. <laughs> and I was born again. And I had to read and try to figure out, like, what, what happened to me? And uh, all I knew was God is real. And this stuff works. You know, you go back to the Baptist church, which we did. Now all the hymns had meaning. It was amazing. These, these words are great. Wow, you know. <laughs> Anybody have an encounter like that? Yeah? And if you're here this morning, and either you started out and lapsed because you got hurt, discouraged, disillusioned, and you weren't ready for pushback from the world or whatever, you gave up. Or you've never heard the good news of the gospel. And the good news of the gospel is, hey, you can have your sins forgiven. Not only that, when you die, you go to heaven. You have an eternal life being offered to you because Jesus has paid your debt and opened the way. He's the door. He's the way in. It's the best news ever. And you know what else is sweeping the world right now? It's absolutely sweeping the world. There's well over one billion born-again Christians, and they're from every label and every stripe, Catholics, Orthodox, Jews, Christians. I mean, they're all finding him. There's a great move in Ukraine right now in the midst of that war with all the army and all the people and everything. Isn't it funny when, when you're going through the worst of times, you, you kind of realize, you know, life is, is all important. Is, is the importance of life is what's coming next. And here we, we allow our kids to go to schools and tell them, no, oh, there is no God and Evolution is what happened, and when you die, that's the end of you. And really, all this struggle just to lose it all in 80, 90 years doesn't make any sense. No. We have a future, friends. We have heaven to gain and hell to shun because hell is also real. He does not want you to go there. That is reserved for the devil and his crowd. And Jesus came to offer you not just a way out, but a way in. So I want you to think about it. Do you need a savior to rescue you? How many do? How many have? And if you realize, you know, it's not what church you join or whether you join any church. That's not the issue. The issue is for you to believe in him. And, you know, a lot of people 
don't because they're so hurt and wounded. Sometimes people have been wounded by pastors or priests or religious people. And so they let that reflect against God. Listen, God didn't do that. They misrepresented him. God loves you. John 3.16 is your takeaway this morning. God so loved the world, meaning you, put your name in there, that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would just believe in him, nothing to do, just believe, they would never perish but have everlasting life. I'd like us to take communion together in remembering the resurrection of our Savior. You know, he said, he said some challenging things. One was, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. You know, I've mulled that one around for a long time. But what he's saying is, I want you to eat me and drink me spiritually. I want you to take me into every cell of your body because that's where the life is. The life is not in you and I in the flesh. The life is in him. And so as we eat of him, I want Jesus to permeate every cell of my body because I love him. I, I love his ways. I love his words. I love his works and miracles just everything about him, and I want to be like him. And when you think of the fruit of the Spirit, that's what he's like, loving, joyful, peaceful, gentle, on and on. What a king. I want to be like him, don't you? And since we know that life is in the blood, uh, I love that the book of Hebrews tells us that the blood of Jesus cries better things than the blood of Abel. You remember Cain killed his brother Abel, and apparently Abel was crying out from the ground, from the place of the dead. Avenge me of, of my brother has murdered me. I need justice here. He's crying for justice. But the blood of Jesus doesn't cry for justice. His blood is crying for what? Mercy. And even from the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, forgive them. Forgive these murderers because they don't know what they're doing. Oh, my goodness. I want you to prepare the elements together. And, you know, you got to open it carefully. There's a transparent layer on the top that lets the wafer out. And you got to get that right or you might spill the juice all over you. <laughs> so let's, let's do this together. Take the, take, the, take the bread out, the wafer out. And see this represents the body of the Lord Jesus. This is the body of the Lord Jesus. Broken for you, broken by you. You see, it begs the question, well, wait a minute. Who did kill Jesus after all? Was it the Jewish people who, who said, away with him, crucify him? Yeah, partly. Was it the Romans as Pilate caved in and said, all right, crucify him? Yeah, partly. But mainly, it was you and me who made it necessary that the Savior would come to pay our debt for us so that we had a basis for forgiveness. And so whenever I break the bread, I'm reminded that I actually was the one breaking his body. And he did this for me and you. Let's break the bread together. And then eat him and take him into every cell of your body and tell him 
Thank you, Jesus. With all my heart, I want to be like you. I want to be kind like you. I want to be good like you. I want to do miracles like you. I want to be smart like you. I want to be loving like you. I want to be forgiving like you. And then very carefully peel off the second layer. Lord, we've read about all the blood that was shed through animal sacrifices. All the while you looked at it as a symbol of the one who was to come and shed his royal blood to cover the sins of the whole world, starting with me. Thank you, Jesus. Let's drink his blood together. Mm. Lord, I ask you to wash us clean. We want to turn away from wrongdoing, from hurting people, from self-centeredness, from lying, stealing, cheating, From every type of sin, sexual sin, violent sin, occult sin. We ask you to wash us and help us to come into a place of forgiveness and being right with God. Get us ready for eternity. Lord, the way the world's going, it won't be long until you return to the earth to rule and reign in righteousness and truth. What a promise. So friends, if you're here today and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, or perhaps you once did, But life happened around you and you got so discouraged and disillusioned and disappointed that you turned away. But yet you're here this morning because, I don't know, someone said, hey, why don't you come to church with me? Or you just felt to come. This is a very important message for you. Because Jesus stands at your heart's door knocking right now, as it says in Revelation chapter 3, chapter 1, rather. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and meet with him and he with me. See, one thing you need to realize is that Jesus is not going to bully you into submission because his kingdom is a love kingdom. And he wants you to respond to a message of love which says, I love you and I came to redeem you and pay your debt so that you could be forgiven and therefore restored to relationship with God your Father. You know, the reasons why people don't want them is because often their parents or their friends or someone was a such a poor example of being a Christian that they said, well, if that's what Christians are like, I want nothing to do with them. <sighs> or maybe you just got carried away. Sometimes people go to university and they... They're told there is no God, and they get carried up. Let's go make money, and let's this and that. And it becomes all about success in this life, here and now, without uh, any thought about success in the hereafter. And so I encourage you just to wake up 
to some things and follow the science. But if you're under a load of guilt and, and sin, you know, maybe you've caused things to go wrong in the lives of others and your conscience is really aware of it. You also need a savior who can pronounce you forgiven. And it may be a while before you have a better opportunity than right now to say yes to him. But if you know that you need a savior and you want him in your heart today, I'm going to ask you just to admit that to yourself right now and say, yeah, I admit, I, I need Jesus Christ. I need God's answer. I need God's Savior to be my Savior and to forgive me. And see, that's, that's called getting honest with him. Because if you just go through the motions and say the words, it doesn't really count because he's not fooled by that. But when you get serious and you mean it, intentionally mean it, then he hears that prayer and he draws near to you. And I believe there's a number of people who are, who are meant to make decisions for Jesus this morning. That's your only commitment is to him. So can we all stand together as we bring this to a conclusion? If you just told the Lord that I... I want you in my life. I'm not talking to committed believers now, but people who have been away from God or perhaps are hearing something like this for the first time. If you told God that you want Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life, that you'd realize you need a Savior, and he, being the Son of God, is the only one who can save you. You see, Muhammad can't save you because actually he's a man. Buddha, same thing, can't save you. Uh, politics can't save you. Religion, per se, cannot save you. The saints can't save you. Only Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And when he dies for you and pays your debt, let me tell you, your debt is paid. If you told him, I want you in my life as my Savior and Lord, I'm going to ask you unashamedly to hold your hand up high right now. And only those people. Just hold your hand up high and wave it at me. Would you do that? Just wave it. I told him and I meant it. God bless you back there. Anyone else that I can see? God bless you back there. Okay. If you raised your hand for this appeal and you're serious about it, I'm going to ask you to get out of your seats and come on down to the front right now so that I can pray with you and bless you and help you make this massively important step. So come on. Just come. It'll be the best day and the best Easter you've ever had in your whole life. So, so come on. Come, come, come. God bless you, sweetheart. Bless you. Just stand with me. God bless you. Yeah, just, just stand right here. And, and all of you guys watching on, on the video stream, uh, you can do this at home. You might want to just kneel down right where you are and uh, pray this prayer that I'm going to pray in a moment. But some of you might be a bit like I was 
you know, I, I really need to be down there, but I'm not going down there in front of all these people kind of thing. So I want you to just turn to your friend and, and say very lovingly, should you be down at the front with these others? And if they say, well, yeah, then you offer to come with them. And we'll just wait another minute for, for you, but I don't want anybody to miss this. Because this is a big deal. And you know what? You, you could be a person that's gone to church all your life. And uh, like, you know, I went to church a lot. But I, I, never, I never made the decision. I never really embraced it. It just seemed like that was then, 2,000 years ago, whatever. If you, need to, if you need to join in on this prayer, I'm telling you there's something very important about stepping up and stepping out and coming forward. Well, I want us all to pray this prayer together, especially you guys who have come. God bless you. Thank you so much. But all of us in our seats and all of us at home, I want us to pray this prayer as a prayer of remembrance and thanksgiving, like thank you, Jesus, for being who you are and just celebrating the fact that he's the way in, he's the door. Are you ready? With all of our hearts, right? Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you this morning. I admit that I have sinned. I've done many things wrong. I've hurt myself and others, and especially you. But Lord, I'm sorry for, for my sins this morning. I turn away from them all. And I invite Jesus, the Son of God, to come into my life. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Wash me clean from all my sins and forgive me. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead for me. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for me. Thank you for forgiving me and for writing my name in the book of life. Amen. And the Bible is full of assurance that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it doesn't matter what we've done. His blood is worth a million times more than all the bad stuff you've done. Isn't it amazing? Fire on him. Fire on each and every one of them. Lord, let this truth go deep, deep, deep these young people here how old are you sweetie 13 is a wonderful age you know imagine being 13 and being born again and ready to go for God Woo. how old are you young man 10 years old come on congratulations Lord I ask you to bless these young people let your fiery love be their portion I'm not going to say, how old are you, young man? <laughs> but congratulations to each and every one of you. Holy Spirit, let the truth of Scripture go deep, deep, deep into each and every heart. And I want to, all of you, make sure you get a Bible, okay? The Bible is the Word of God. 
Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It's written by 40 different authors and none of them contradict each other. It's amazing. It's proven by its prophetic words. It's proven by its um, archeology. span It's proven by just doing life with it. It works, basically. It will take you from here to there. Put your trust in it and let it be your roadmap to heaven, all right? Let's give them a big welcome to the kingdom of God. Okay. Pastor, do you give anything out or what do you do at this point? You have a team here. Can you just go with that nice lady just for a few minutes and and she'll get you something to read and and bless you and encourage you a little more. All right. Well, happy Resurrection Day, everybody. I prefer calling it that than Easter. It is a glorious, glorious thing that our Savior is not still hanging on a cross or still dead. He's alive forevermore. And, uh, oh my goodness, it's just the best news ever. And of course, it won't be long until he returns. So get filled up with the message of the soon return of the Lord Jesus, won't you? It's going to be the greatest day since the creation. I promise you. So, Pastor Johnny, back to you. Come on, how many received something today? Praise God.